Bestbookbits.com brings you the book summary of Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. Lucius Annius Seneca, statesman, philosopher, advocate and man of letters, was born at Cordoba in Spain around 4 BC. He rose to prominence in Rome, pursuing a career in the courts and political life, for which he had been trained while also acquiring celebrity as an author of the tragedies and essays. Falling foul of successive empires, Caligula in AD 39 and Claudius in AD 41, he spent eight years in exile, allegedly for an affair with Caligula's sister, recalled in AD 49. He was made a praetor and was appointed tutor to the boy who would become, in AD 54, the Emperor Nero. On Nero's succession, Seneca acted for some eight years as an unofficial chief minister. The early part of the reign was remembered as a period of sound government, for which the main credit seems due to Seneca. His control over Nero declined as enemies turned the emperor against him with representations that his popularity made him a danger, or with accusations of immorality or excessive wealth. Retiring from public life, he devoted his last three years to philosophy and writing, particularly the letters to Lucilius. In AD 65, following the discovery of a plot against the emperor, in which he was thought to be implicated, he and many others were compelled to Nero to commit suicide. His fame as an essayist and dramatist lasted in two to three centuries ago, when he passed into literary oblivion, from which the 20th century has seen a considerable recovery. Book Summary Notes It is man's duty to live in conformity with the divine will, and this means firstly, bringing his life into line with nature's laws, and secondly, resigning himself completely and uncomplainingly to whatever fate may send him. In this way we shall arrive at the true end of man, Happiness, though having attained the one and only good thing in life, the ideal or goal, called arete in Greek and in Latin, virtus, for which the English word virtue is so unsatisfactory a translation. This, the simon bonum, or supreme ideal, is usually summarized in ancient philosophy as a combination of four qualities, wisdom, or moral insight, courage, self-control, and justice, or upright dealing. Nothing to my way of thinking is a better proof of a well-ordered mind than man's ability to just stop just where he is and pass some time in his own company. To be everywhere is to be nowhere. People who spend their whole life traveling abroad end up having plenty of places where they can find hospitality, but no real friendships. The same must needs be the case with people who never said about acquiring an intimate acquaintance with any one great writer, but skip from one to another, paying flying visits to them all. A plant which is frequently moved never grows strong. So always read well-tried authors. And if at any moment you find yourself wanting to change from a particular author, go back to the ones you have read before. Each day, too, acquire something that which will help you face poverty or death and other ills as well. It is not the man who is too little who is poor, but the one who hankers after more. You ask, what is the proper limit to a person's wealth? First, having what is essential. And second, having what is enough. But if you walk in on anyone as a friend when you do not trust him as you trust yourself, you are making a grave mistake and have failed to grasp sufficiently the full force of true friendship. Regard him as loyal and you will make him loyal. Some men's fear of being deceived has taught people to deceive them. By their superstitious, they give them the right to do the wrong thing by them. For a delight in bustling about is not industry. It is only the restless energy of a hunted mind. And the state of mind that looks on all activity as tiresome is not true repose, but a spineless inertia. Ask nature. She will tell you what she made both day and night. I view with pleasure and approval the way you keep on at your studies and sacrifice everything to your single-minded efforts to make yourself every day a better man. Avoid shabby attire long hair, and an unkept beard. An outspoken dislike of silverware, sleeping on the ground, and all other misguided means to self-advertisement. Let our aim be a way of life not diametrically opposed to, but better than that of the mob. Anyone entering our home should admire us rather than our furnishings. Limiting one's desires actually helps to cure one of fear. Cease to hope, he says, and you will cease to fear. Fear keeps peace with hope, nor does their so moving together surprise me, both belong to a mind in suspense, to a mind in a state of anxiety, through looking into the future. Both are mainly due to projecting our thoughts far ahead of us instead of adapting ourselves to the present. 
There is no enjoying the possession of anything valuable unless one has someone to share it with. But nothing is as ruinous to the character as sitting away one's time at a show, for it is then, through the medium of entertainment, that vice creep into one with more than usual ease. But the right thing is to shun both courses. You should neither become like the bad, because they are the many, nor be an enemy of the many, because they are unlike you. Associate with people who are likely to improve you. Welcome those who you are capable of improving. This process is a mutual one. Men learn as they teach. Men learn as they teach. To me, says Democritus, a single man is a crowd, and a crowd is a single man. The many speak highly of you, but have you really any grounds for satisfaction with yourself if you are the kind of person that many understand? Your merits should not be outward facing. Indulge the body just so far as suffices for good health. What you have to understand is that Tatch makes a person just as good a roof as gold does. What fortune has made yours is not your own. But while he does not hanker after what he has lost, he does not prefer not to lose them. Any man, he says, who does not think that what he has is more than ample is an unhappy man, even if he is the master of the whole world. We need to set our affections on some good man and keep him constantly before our eyes, so that we may live as if he were watching us and do everything as if he saw what we were doing. Happy the man who improves other people, not merely when he is in their presence, but even when he is in their thoughts. Be always pointing him out to yourself, either as the guardian or as your model. There is a need, in my view, for someone as a standard against which our characters can measure themselves. We have good reason to say, I trust this finds you in the pursuit of wisdom. So continually remind yourself, Lucilius, of the many things you have achieved. When you look at all the people out in front of you, think of all the ones behind you. Why be concerned about others? Come to that when you're outdone your own self. It is clear to you, I know, Lucilius, that no one can lead a happy life, or even one that is bearable, without the pursuit of wisdom, and that the perfection of wisdom is what makes the happy life. It molds and builds the personality, orders one's life, regulates one's conduct, shows one what one should do, and what one should leave undone, sits at the helm and keeps one on the correct course, as one is tossed about in perilous seas. If you shape your life according to nature, you will never be poor. If according to the people's opinions, you will never be rich. Remaining dry and sober takes a good deal more strength of will when everyone about one is puking drunk. It takes a more developed sense of fitness, on the other hand, not to make of oneself a person apart, to be neither indistinguishable from those about one nor conspicuous by one's difference, to do the same things but not in the quite the same manner, for a holiday can be celebrated without extravagant festivity. Set aside now and then a number of days during which you will be content with the plainest of food and very little of it, and with rough, coarse clothing, and will ask yourself, is this what one used to dread? So my dear Lucilius, start following these men's practice and appoint certain days on which to give up everything and make yourself at home with next to nothing. Start cultivating a relationship with poverty. A good character is the only guarantee of everlasting carefree happiness. But something that can never be learned too thoroughly can never be said too often. With some people you can only need to point to a remedy. Others need to have it rammed into them. How can you wonder your travels do you no good when you carry yourself around with you? You were saddled with the very thing that drove you away. I wasn't born for the one particular corner, the whole world's my home country. A consciousness of wrongdoing is the first step to salvation. This is why I look on people like this as a spiritless lot, the people who are forever acting as interpreters and never as creators, always lurking in someone else's shadow. They never venture to do for themselves the things they have spent such a long time learning. A philosopher whose delivery, like his life, should be well ordered. Nothing can be well regulated if it is done in a breakneck hurry. Nonetheless, what is waited for does sink in more readily than what goes flying past. Besides, how can a thing possibly govern others when it cannot be governed itself? The upshot then of what I have to say is this. I am telling you 
to be a slow speaking person. In each and every good man, a God, what God we are uncertain, dwells. No one should feel pride in anything that is not his own. Man's ideal state is realized when he has fulfilled the purpose for which he was born. And what is that reason demands of him? Something very easy, that he lives in accordance with his own nature. No one can lead a happy life if he thinks of himself and turns everything to his own purposes. With afflictions of the spirit, though, the opposite is the case. The worse the person is, the less he feels it. Voices, I think, are more inclined to distract one than general noise. Noise merely fills one's ears, battering away at them while voices actually catch one's attention. The fact that the body is lying down is for no reason supposing that the mind is at peace. Rest is sometimes far from restful. There's no difference between the one and the other. You didn't exist and you won't exist. You have no concern with either period. Comfort in thoughts, provided they are not a discreditable kind, contribute to a person's cure. Anything which raises his spirits benefits him physically as well. My own advice to you, and not only in the present illness, but in your whole life as well, is this. Refuse to let the thought of death bother you. Nothing is grim when we have escaped that fear. Nobody can be in acute pain and feel it for long. Nature, in her unlimited kindness to us, has so arranged things as to make pain either bearable or brief. A man is as unhappy as he has convinced himself he is. I'm suffering severe pain, you may say. Well, does it stop you from suffering it if you endure it in a womanish fashion? An illness that's swift and short will have one of two results, either one self or it will be snuffed out. And what difference does it make whether I or it disappears? Either way, there's an end to the pain. For a life spent viewing all the variety, the majesty, the sublimity in things around us can never succumb to anew. The feeling that one is tired of being, of existing, is usually the result of an ideal and inactive leisure. And we should indeed live as if we were in public view, and think, too, as if someone could peer into the innermost recesses of our hearts, which someone can. Tell them of all the things men do that they would blush at sober, and that drunkenness is nothing but a state of self-induced insanity. Well, I have no respect for any study whatsoever if its end is in making of money. What's the use of overcoming opponent after opponent in wrestling or boxing rings if you can be overcome by your temper? It is incredible, Lucilius, how easily even great men can be carried away from the truth by the sheer pleasure of holding forth on a subject. The story is told that someone complained to Socrates that traveling abroad had never done him any good and received the reply. What else can you expect? seeing that you always take yourself along with you when you go abroad. What a blessing it would be for some people if they could only lose themselves. Travelling doesn't make a man a doctor or a public speaker. There isn't a single art which is acquired merely by being in one place rather than another. It's not because they're hard that we lose confidence. They're hard because we lack the confidence. But first we have to reject the life of pleasures. They make us soft and womanish. They are insistent in their demands, and what is more, requires to make insistent demands on fortune. Every person without exception has someone to whom he confines everything that is confined to himself. Here is your noble spirit, the one with which has put itself in the hands of fate. On the other side, we have the puny, degenerate spirit which struggles and which sees nothing right in the way of the universe is ordered and would rather reform the gods than reform itself. A person going out into the sun, whether or not this is what he's going out for, will require a tan. People prone to every fault they denounce are walking advertisements of the uselessness of their training. More active and commemorable still is the person who is waiting for the daylight and interprets the first rays of sun. Shame on him who lies in bed dozing when the sun is high in the sky. Those waking hours commenced in the middle of the day, or even this time, for a lot of people, is the equivalent of the small hours. Can you imagine that these people know how one ought to live when they do not know when one ought to live? We are attracted by wealth, pleasures, good looks, political advancement, and various other welcomings and enticing prospects. We are repelled by exertion, death, pain, disgrace, 
and limited means. It follows that we need to train ourselves not to crave for the former and not to be afraid of the latter. And last, philosophy has no business to supply vice with excuses. A sick man who is encouraged to live in a reckless manner by his doctor has not a hope of getting well. And that's a wrap on the book summary of Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. Before you go, if you want to support Best Book Bits, you can by subscribing to the YouTube channel, hitting the bell for notifications, like, share, and comment. Now, if you want to get this book summary in PDF format sent to your email, pop, click the link below, and I will send this straight to your email. Now, we've created the book called Success in 50 Steps, which we've taken 500 book summaries and condensed them down into one fantastic book on personal development. So grab your copy now, Success in 50 Steps, using the link below. If you want to be coached and mentored by myself, I am open for coaching and mentoring to help you achieve your goals and dreams quicker than you can by yourself. If you're interested in our 150 top best book bit summaries, I've compiled this into one massive PDF, 2,500 pages over five parts, with 50 hours of video and 50 hours of audio content. Also, you can check us out at bestbookbits.com where we have over 600 written book summaries up there currently and more to come. You can find us on Spotify at Best Book Bits, where we upload our summaries first on Spotify and YouTube second. So follow us on Spotify at Best Book Bits. And if you want me to do a book summary, DM me on Instagram where you can find me and we can chat there further. We also have a book club on Facebook at Best Book Bits. And also, if you want to be updated with the latest book summaries via email, pop your email in the link below. You can support us on Patreon as well and check out our top 50 YouTube videos. Thanks for watching and listening. Hope you have an amazing day and hope you got something out of this Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. Take care. Bye-bye now.